Hello and welcome to today's webinar. Sales agents, we are talking about are you ready to go out on your own? Are you ready to make the plunge to go independent? We're going to talk about everything you need to know to make a successful transition to an independent sales agent in today's freelance marketplace. Again, welcome. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood and I'm glad to be with you today talking about this topic. My name is Jess Magooch. I am the Director of Agent Recruitment and Success at Commission Crowd, which I'll let you know a little bit more about later. And I live in Buckingham, Pennsylvania, which is pretty much equidistance between Philadelphia and New York in the United States, since we do have people on today all over the world. And I'd love to know where you're from after... Um, this webinar, I'd love to, you know, chat and send me an email and let me know a little bit more about you after after the call. That would be awesome. Love meeting people all around the world. So a uh, little bit about me. I have 15 years of experience recruiting, training, and managing commission-only sales teams. Um, the last opportunity I worked with, I built a team of 30 full-time salespeople all independent 1099 salespeople. We built a startup from zero to over $40 million a year in annual recurring revenue. Um, so now I am the global director of agent recruitment and success for Commission Crowd, which is a platform that matches independent sales reps with uh, opportunities offered to independent salespeople. My main job is to invite new agents onto the platform and uh, help them match up with opportunities, and ultimately help them make money through our platform. That's when everybody's happy, right? <laughs> so our agenda for today, we're going to get give an overview of what we're now calling the gig economy. It's the new term. We'll talk about what that is and uh, certain definitions so we're all on the same page. We'll talk about why there is this trend in self-employment and more specifically in sales reps going self-employed. And then we'll talk about some of your options, whether you are an independent rep or a sales employee, or if you think you're ready to take a plunge and, and own your own business, we'll talk about some of the pros and cons of each because you might be on the fence right now. Or we're going to look at some of those pros and cons from our perspective. And then we'll talk about what it takes to make a successful transition to an independent salesperson. We want to make sure you can check off all the boxes so you have a better idea if you're a right fit to go independent. It's definitely not for everybody, but you know, if you're wondering if it's for you, that this, this is definitely the call. And if you know it's for you, this is also the call, the webinar to be on because we're going to go through how to spot a good commission-only role. We're going to go through all the check marks to look through um, all the factors to consider and also the legal considerations. Do you have to set up your own business? What might be some different legalities in different places around the world? Um, tax considerations, things like that. And then before we go, I'll tell you a little bit more about Commission Crowd and how we might be able to help you make this transition. Uh, there is nothing for me to sell you on this webinar today, so nothing will, no surprises at the end of me trying to tell you something, but I do hope at the end, my hope is that you do decide to come and create a free profile on Commission Crowd. Um, if you do decide to make that transition to being an independent sales rep, we're here for you with uh, vetted opportunities to help you set up, with, get you set up with your um, portfolio of products and services that you'd like to sell. And who are you, right? You're either, tell me if I'm right here, you're either already an independent sales rep and you're trying to figure out how to identify the right opportunities for you. Um, you may all have, you may be a sales employee right now. So you're working for a company as an employee. You might not even be in sales yet at all, number three. So, um, you know, there might be some people here looking um for a career transition and sales might fit their lifestyle perfectly, independent sales, but you've never actually done it before, that's cool too. Or perhaps you own your own business and you're looking for a way to you know, exit your business but still have you know, a semi-business ownership opportunity where um, you, you're great at sales and you're perhaps you know, looking for an opportunity where you could make money focusing on your, your best talents. 
And then number five is, you know, none of the above. <laughs> I'm sure there's plenty of you out there as well. And I'd be interested to see um, why you are on, on the webinar today. So we could perhaps help other people like you as well. Okay, so let's talk about this new term, the gig economy. Have you heard it before? Um, it's kind of what they're using to describe this trend towards people working for themselves on a freelance basis across multiple industries. Let's take a look at some statistics, shall we? First, let's look at the United States since that's where I'm from. Uh, nearly 54 million Americans participated in some form of independent work in 2015. And that's more than 33% of the entire U.S. workforce. And it's an increase of 700,000 workers over the previous year. And it's also happening in the U.K. The predictions are that half of the United Kingdom's working population will be self-employed in the next five years. Half. Again, across all industries, not just sales. And in the European Union as a whole, they saw a 45% increase in the number of independent workers from 2012 to 2013, which represents the fastest growing group in the labor market. And in India, India, they are way ahead. In India's independent workforce, it is the second largest in the world at 15 million people, which fills about 40% of the world's freelance jobs. And so this was a report done by Spira called the Freedom Economy Report. And it, you can uh, look that up if you'd like to see more details about that. But definitely shows a trend towards people working for themselves, independent, running, running their own show. And you can do it too. <laughs> We're going to talk about how to do that in sales today. So let's get some definitions out of the way. Uh, you can call independent salesperson a lot of things. And I have a background in theater. I went to NYU for, for theater. So of course I have to make the Shakespeare reference here. But a rose by any other name still sells, smells as sweet. Still sells as sweet. <laughs> Freudian slip there. A rose by any other name still smells as sweet. So whether you call yourself an independent sales rep or a commission-only sales representative or a manufacturer's representative, which might be exclusive to you know, selling product lines, or a 1099 sales representative or a self-employed sales representative, which would be more specifically in the U.S., a tax, tax denotation. Um, whether you call yourself any of these things, you are an independent sales rep. So we might interchange these terms. Um, just know that we mean all the same things. People who are working independently for themselves, representing one or more end clients to, to a target market. Typically, um, you'd be selling one or more products or services to the same target market. So you can sell complementary products and services to an existing client base. So the easiest way to see that is a manufacturer's rep, right? So they, they uh, have a list of, of of contacts, perhaps in the retail industry. So they're constantly going back to the same retailers to show them what's new and great in the market and they're representing multiple products. But, you know, if they are with Toys R Us, for instance, they're probably representing many different kinds of toy products, but to the same target market. And this can be done in all different kinds of industries. You can lump together products and services to sell to, you know, executives or Fortune 500 companies or small businesses. Um, so you can have multiple streams of income coming from the same market. But so these are all different terms we, we might use. You might use what you want to put on your business card is your choice. Okay, so why, why, why is this trend in self-employment? You probably know some of these already. Um, first, the financial rewards, right? Going self-employed, though it might take more work to manage your business and make sure that you're, you've always got um, gigs lined up, 
overall and over time, the financial rewards are much higher when you go on your own. Specifically in sales, when you're able to forfeit that salary and invest time in growing your commissions, you're gonna be offered a much higher commission rate than you would with the salary. Now, some people would say, well, the salary might offset that difference in commissions. But that is true in the beginning, but over time, if you are a great salesperson and you're a top rep in your company right now, over time, the, um, the decreased commissions that you get in, in exchange for a salary, um, over time you earn less than you would if you are on a higher commission rate because as you're making more sales, that, that, um, that book is growing. And also you have other opportunities you might not have with, uh, as working with as an employee because you might get residual or ongoing commissions for the life of the book of, the, of business. You don't have to worry about whether or not you're employed with the company. Basically, there's a payoff for the salary. So a long-term financial rewards are higher. The quality of life. Some people go self-employed because they get to make their own terms. They don't have a boss telling them what to do. Um, they don't have anyone telling them where they have to be at any certain time or, or what they have to say or what they have to look like, anything like that. Um, so the, the quality of life of being able to, to, uh, run your own business and run your own future and being in charge of your, your own future. And then that brings along with it freedom of time and location, you know, and this of course is depends on what you sell as a salesperson. Can you sell it from anywhere? Is it, you know, maybe a online software that can be demoed anywhere in the world where you get internet access? Um, and can you work any time that you want to? Uh, you can you can work the number of hours you want to and at the times you want to. And if, if you've got to go to a baseball game for your kid, you don't have to tell anybody that you're going to be leaving, right? It's, it's your business. And then that also relates to work-life balance. You know, for me, being self-employed as a mom is a huge, um, is a huge part of, of the lifestyle that I want because I can be there whenever my kids have um, need, need a volunteer at the school or a school trip or they're sick. I don't have to worry about, you know, getting child care and backup because, um, because no one no one's available because I have to be at work, right? We don't have to worry about sick days and vacation days, right? We can do that whenever we need to. Um, and, and that's me as a mom, but for, you know, for other people, it might be the freedom to travel whenever you want. Um, not have to, you know, be limited to vacation days, not have to work for, you can make a great living and not have to work 40 hours a week. And in, in today's environment, especially in the U.S., you have to work 60, 80 hours a week if you're exchanging time for money. But in sales, as you know, uh, it's, it's much more... Um, it's much more likely that you can earn increased exponential earnings over time if you have your, your agreements set up properly and if you're in the right opportunity so that the number of hours work doesn't necessarily equate to how much you earn. You can earn, you could work less and earn more over time. So let's talk about um, if you're on the fence or uh, being an independent sales rep, and let's say you're a sales employee now, or maybe you're thinking about, you know, you want to make a transition, but maybe you're thinking about opening your own business as, as being the answer to some of the things you want. I'm going to give you a really honest, like flat out comparison, and you might find yourself in any of the camps, but I'm going to show you it from my perspective of what I think the positives and negatives are. So let's look at, um, first we mentioned some of these items under independent sales sales rep, being location independent, being able to make your own hours. Um, some of the things we didn't talk about yet uh, on the financial side, yes, there's high financial reward, but there's also minimal financial risk compared to being a business owner, right? Um, a sales employee, there's no financial risk. A business owner, there's high financial risk because you have to invest a lot in the business to create a product, a service, employees, offices, things like that before you make any money and you may not make any money. Um, as an independent sales rep, all that's been invested for you and you just have to go sell. So the only thing you're investing is your time 
um, which time is money, of course, but it's you're investing your time and also any minimal office expenses that you have, like your phone and your internet, which you probably are paying for already anyway. Um, multiple sources of income. So we talked about repping multiple products, right? You don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. As a sales employee, when you're working for a company, you're putting all your eggs in one basket. And um, if something happens to that company and they're no longer able to support you, guess what? You go on the chopping block. Goodbye. <laughs> so you can have multiple sources of income. And if one of those companies doesn't do so well, you still have the other ones that you that you can represent and you have streams of income coming in. And some of those streams of income are lifetime residuals or renewals. So in most, most independent contracts that I've seen, now of course, you're all going to have different ones, but you, I would suggest looking for something where once you bring in a client, you get paid for the lifetime of that client. So whether it's a subscription service that they're paying on a monthly basis or uh, they're making repeat orders, that you get paid continuously whenever there's uh, additional income from those clients. So let's talk about the difference or the, the, the similarities of being an employee and a sales rep. To me, there's one main one, which is you have one focused purpose every day. Your purpose is to sell. And there's something very freeing about having one purpose um, to do on a daily basis. Whereas a business owner, you're you know wearing all the hats on, on any given day. There's something, re it's definitely refreshing to have one purpose and one goal. Um, and I'm saying that for, as being an independent salesperson and also running my own business. But let's look at some of um, s some of the things that I might see as you know, being exclusive to it, an employee. One is your time and your quotas are dictated to you, right? If someone's telling you, you got to earn this much, you got to make this much, um, or you know, you're gone. We're not paying your salary. Um, and they're also telling you dictating, and they can dictate. As an independent sales rep, they can't tell you how many hours you need to work, where you need to be when, but as an employee, they can dictate to you the hours that you need to work. Now, some may be more flexible than others, um, but ultimately they have that ability to say, no, you need to be in the office these hours. You do have the security of a salary, right? That's exclusive to being an employee. It does come with some payoffs, you know, it, the, the balance of that is that there is less reward over the long term. We talked earlier about why. And the work parameters are dictated to you. You have, they tell you who you have to speak to and when, and you don't get to say whether or not you want to speak to someone, whether or not you want to work with a particular client or a particular market. Um, they might give you benefits, right? So they might give you retirement or health care in the U.S. You know, health care is a big deal. It's more and more difficult to get it if it's not through your employer. I get it. <laughs> um, so you know, that might be that might be a really important thing to consider for you. But in most cases, you know, you can purchase your own insurance and retirement and all that it just becomes an expense of your business. But the downside of that again is you can lose your job at any time, right? At any any sales any sales agreement in the in, as an employee, there's always a stipulation that says we can terminate this agreement at any time. And so, though you have the security of the salary, it can also be taken away at any time. And ultimately, that means the employer is in control of your future. So, oh, and I did say quotas already. Quotas, you know. They're, they're telling you how much you, you need to make for the company, and that could be pressure for some people that, that don't want to have it. You might perform just as well or better, but um, the pressure of someone else telling you what you should make can be a little um, demotivating for some people. And so let's talk about, oh, and then, of course, your vacation and sick days are limited. We mentioned that already as well. Let's talk about, but let's say you're like, well, I'm thinking actually just starting my own business. I have this great idea or I can be a consultant and I can you know, start my own business. Why should I not do that over being an you know, independent sales rep? Well, let's talk about some of the, the similarities. Both of them have tax advantages, right? Typically, you're going to pay less in taxes because you get to write off certain things. And I know at least in the U.S., business owners are favored over employees for tax advantages. Um, there's high reward in both cases. Um, in both cases, you're going to have to pay your own benefits, your own health insurance, your own retirement, things like that. 
Um, but you know what? It's not like it used to be. Any company that you work for every year, those benefits go down and you're paying more into that. And in both cases, you need to have, you'll have ownership of your, your business. You, you own what's coming in and you call the shots and you get to choose the customers. You know, to me, that's a big deal because I've definitely been in situations where I didn't appreciate how I was being treated. But when you own your own business, you, you get to choose where you focus your efforts. But let's talk about some of the downsides of being a business owner. So we talked about financial risk, right? You're putting in lots of money before you get any reward because you've got to develop the product or service first. You have to deliver the product or service. So anytime you're actually delivering, you're not selling. And you know if you've sold full-time how much it takes to get clients in the door. Anytime you're pulling away from the sales process, um, you just have to keep starting over and over to get clients in. And you might have to wait over time to get proof of concept to make sure that the idea that you have is actually going to sell. And then there's the day-to-day -day headaches of being a business owner, like managing employees and office spaces and toilets not working and people not being able to get into the office. Oh, these are things you have to deal with as a business owner. And lastly, let's talk about the similarities of all three of them. Um, and this is where you can tell if you're in the right spot in sales and, as sales or owning your business at all. One, you're a risk taker. Two, you're willing to invest time to gain, to have gains over time. You have a belief and a passion in your product or service. You have to have that to sell anything. You have to have a tough skin, right? You can't take things personally. You have to be able to, to take no's and take rejection because you're going to get more no's than you are yeses. That's part of the deal in sales. It just never feels good to hear no. Um, you're going to have to take accountability for your own results, right? You can't blame anybody else for how much money you make or how many sales you make at the end. It's always on you, whether it's, you know, getting better at, at how you sell or uh, making sure that your product or service is, is what your customers want. You need to take accountability and make sure you're doing the activity to get the results that you want. And also constantly improving your skills. In all cases, to be the best at what you do, you're, you're going to need to be investing in, you know, training and courses and certifications and whatnot and whatever you can get your hands on to do better at your job. There's no such thing as perfect, right? So no matter how many years you've been doing it, you always want to be increasing your skill level and, um, and ultimately that helps you help your customers better and in the end makes you money and helps you achieve your dreams better. So what does it take to be a successful independent salesperson? How do you know if you're ready? You want all this, right? But is it right for you? Well, I'm going to tell you from my years of experience, what I've seen um, is, you know, a good formula for a successful independent salesperson. One, a proven track record or an eagerness to learn sales. So either if you've done sales before and you weren't very good at it, you probably won't be very good at it working on your own either, <laughs> okay? So, if, but if you are a top performer at your organization and you feel like you can manage yourself, then you'll probably be a top performer for yourself as well. And if you don't have any sales experience, that's okay too. I've definitely worked with people that have had no sales experience but had all the other uh, factors that we're going to talk about and an eagerness to learn sales. Sales is a learnable skill. It's not something you're born with for sure. It's just like, you know, crafting anything. It can be learned. Um, so you can, you either know you're great at sales or you want to learn sales. You have a business owner mindset. You're willing to take accountability for your results and ownership of your business. It's very different from being an employee where someone else is in charge and, and someone else has to, to manage and take accountability for everything. You're financially stable, right? So not, no, you're not rolling, rolling in the money, but obviously, you know, you're, you, everyone has their own financial goals, but financially stable so that you're able to pay your bills and you're able to, you know, sustain yourself for some period of time while you're building up your what we call book of business so that you can sustain yourself. Now, how long you need to be able to sustain yourself 
will depend on the kinds of products that you're selling. So if you're selling things with longer sales cycles, um, you'll have to sustain yourself longer, but you might need to find something with shorter sales cycles so that you doesn't take so long, maybe a few months or, or, or one month to, to start making sales in your business, in your new business. You need to be a leader, right? You need to be able to get out there and get up in the morning and lead yourself into the work day. No one's going to be waking you up or waiting for you at the office or asking you how many sales you made. So you need to be able to lead yourself. And you need to work independently. So for some people, um, a team office environment is what they want. Um, for other people, they pref- they feel like they get more done when they work independently. I'm one of those people. Um, but I'm also very social. So I make sure I stay connected to other salespeople, other independent salespeople, and to my clients. You know, I develop relationships with them so that Even though I'm working by myself, it never feels that way. You need to have either have an established network or the ability to build one or learn how to build one, which I could show you too. Um, So if you're selling a product that is perhaps a longer sales cycle or really tough market to crack into, you're going to want to choose something where you have an established network of contacts. So if you've sold to small businesses in the past, You probably want to try to choose something that's also selling to small businesses where you could at least start with your existing client base. Um, But if you don't have a network established or perhaps you just moved and you don't know anybody, can you build one? Can you quickly go out and um, either by any one of the, you know, I teach 13 different strategies to, to build prospects, but networking, online networking, you know, can you build it, uh, can you generate interest via email campaigns or phone calls or door to door selling or whatever it takes to build a network to get your business going? Can you do that? Um, so if you've checked off all of those things, then I would say, let's do it, right? And now we're going to talk about how to spot a good commission only role because I will tell you just because the, the, um, product or service might be great. You might believe in it wholeheartedly, but it might not be a good commission only role. You still want to make sure it, it satisfies you financially that if you're going to invest the time and money into a company, that you have an an arrangement that is going to yield you um, great financial rewards, right? So it's a win-win relationship. They their company gets built, and your you know your wallet gets built, and you're you're able to give the your family and yourself all those dreams that you have that you wanted to use the money for. So how do you spot a good commission only role? First, commission, <laughs> obviously, that's a huge one. Um, but commission is basically the percentage you get paid on each sale. And commission's a consideration, you, they, they vary based on industry and product. You know, a, as a manufacturer's rep, you might see commissions hovering around 10%. As a, you know, s- online software demos, you might see hovering, you know, 30 to 50%. So it really depends on what you're selling, what the typical commission rate is, but do the math. You know, how many sales do you have to make to make it to decent living? And is is that number of sales feasible? And residuals. So do, residuals, or another word is renewals, are, are also known as ongoing commissions, right? So if there's a company that has for instance, a subscription-based product or something where there's ongoing orders or repeat orders, I want to know that I'm going to get paid every time that person or that client that I brought continues to bring money to the company. So it's like an, an ownership of that book of business. And um, I would I would recommend that if there is a possibility for renewal commissions that, that you look for something where or negotiate something where you're getting paid every time the customer pays. And sometimes, you know, typically what I see is that, you know, the first year or the first order, you get paid more 
then ongoing or second year residuals or commissions, they might be a drop. That's, that's okay. That's typical. Um, the, I, cause the push is to keep getting in new business and your, your book of business grows over time, but you don't really have to do much to maintain that. You know, the company is maintaining that they're doing the service, they're delivering the product or what have you. But definitely residuals is how you build wealth over time as an independent salesperson because you're at, eventually you get to a point where there's checks coming in and you're not actually doing any work for it. So any, you know, any additional sales you make is just continuing to grow that. Um, I've definitely, I've known salespeople that, that are, that have been earning over a hundred thousand dollars a month in residual renewal commissions. So, um, you know, when, and that's over five to 10 years. I mean, we're not talking about that being built, you know, after a year, but if you can find something where over time you're able to earn that kind of money, it's definitely feasible. I know a lot of people that have done it. Uh, bonuses. So there also might be bonus pools that you could participate in. And depending on the company, that might be a big portion of the actual, um, income that you would generate at the end of the year. So consider that. And uh, profit sharing. So profit sharing is when, when you earn part of the company every time you sell something. Like typically it's an arrangement where you earn a share or a fraction of a share for each sale or based on dollar amounts, however it's arranged. Um, and basically you're building you're building up a stock portfolio in the company that you represent. So this, this is a great idea of, on behalf of, for companies to give, to do some kind of profit sharing because it gives the salesperson an added incentive to put their time and effort into this company over the long term. If you're just getting paid once to sell something, it's really difficult to stay motivated over time to, to sell that product. But if you have ownership in the company, then you automatically now have this vested interest in making sure the company as a whole is healthy and you're going to have a long-term reward for the sales that you did. And so if it's a company that maybe goes public one day, you get to participate in the IPO of the company. Or if it stays private, at some point they start paying dividends. Um, this varies from company to company, um, but if... If it's something that's offered, it's it's definitely, you know, it may or may not ever happen. You may not ever make any money from the profit sharing part, but it's it's something you want to consider whether or not the company's offering um, ownership in their company for the investment that you're making in, in um, before you, you know, make any sales. Uh, the opportunity to build a team, manage a team, and earn what we call overrides. So overrides would be like a per percentage on top of the people that you manage of all the sales that they bring in. So this may or may not be for you, right? Like you might want to be independent and not have to deal with managing a team. Um, that's you know definitely something to consider because I've seen people go into management and make less money initially because they're so focused on helping other people grow. But over time, typically you would make a lot more because you're leveraging your time, your talent, your expertise in building a team to basically duplicate yourself in the market. And if you're a great salesperson and you definitely want to duplicate yourself and, you know, training and managing is, it really is a separate skill set from sales. But if you have that skill set, then you might want to look at opportunities that in time, offer you the ability to build a team and earn overrides. A company that has a proven sales system. Are you the first salesperson? Have they ever tested this product in the market, or are you the are you actually you know market testing this uh, product or service? Um, I would you know lean towards companies that have a proven sales system where they've garnered gained a certain amount of traction and clients on their own, you know, as an executive team before they started hiring commission only sales reps. And that through that process of gaining their first initial client base, they understand and have refined the sales process and the sales scripts and they have scripts for you. Um, they have presentations made up, they have marketing materials for you. So 
what's the sales system that they've figured out works so that you can just duplicate it and start making money. Um, now, you may or may not have the skill set to create a sales system for them. Um, if you do, that's awesome. It just it will still take you time. It's still that time factor to figure it out before you get that engine running and you know what works and what doesn't. So a proven sales system, something you can ask them for is their sales playbook. Like, do you have a sales playbook? Do you have a, you know, a system, a set of scripts, recorded demos, things like that. Uh, leads. So leads are, some people love them, some people hate them, you know, but they're definitely something to consider depending on what you're selling and what your experience is, level is or what your network is. But leads are basically people who have said in some way or other that they're interested in the product or service. <laughs> so they're definitely not a sale. You know, you're not calling them to take an order. That's not what a lead is, even though most every salesperson would love it if that was the case. But a lead is, is simply someone who's maybe gone to the website and filled out a contact form for more information, requested a price quote. Maybe they downloaded a, a very targeted white paper or attended a trade show and expressed interest in learning more. Those are all leads and some companies um, have engines that generate leads on a regular basis where you can expect a lot of leads and maybe they give them to you for a short period of time. Maybe um, they allow you to, sometimes you can buy your own leads. I would just suggest like coordinating with the company, make sure you're not like double duplicating your efforts on purchasing leads. Um, they might have a, you know, there's lots of companies that, outsource their lead generation and there's some that that don't give you any leads at all it's all you know self-generated or you know working your existing network but whether or not leads are included is something to consider if you've never worked with leads before or you've you're used to working with leads if you prefer them or not prefer them everyone's different but if if it's important to you then you want to know how qualified the leads are and how many you can expect to get in, in a week and what the close ratios are on the leads that they have had in the past. Um, and you, when you have a call with them, you want to get a feel for whether how they see you as, do they see you as an employee or do they see you as a potential partner? So the, the best, you know, commission only sales relationships are where they, the end client sees you as a partner in the company and not, you know, a consultant or an outside employee, you know. So they really need to treat you the, the way you deserve because you are investing time and money into building their organization. So it, even if it's not on paper, you're not a partner, the feeling is that it, this is a partnership. So you'll want to assess that kind of as that you'll just feel on the phone call, the way they talk to you, the questions they ask you. Does it feel like a, you know, a sales employee phone call or does it feel like, you know, they're bringing on a partner or an investor because uh, you are investing in them? And what kind of training and support do they provide? You know, are they helping you get better at what you do? How much can they provide about what their success has already been in the market? What kind of... Um, uh, expenses are they perhaps willing to reimburse you for? What kind of marketing materials can you expect? I mean, I, I don't want to say there's like a good or bad for, for anything, but I'm just, I just do want to encourage you to assess all those factors because however important it is to you, you'll want to ask those questions during the interview process. You know, it's it's really a waste of everyone's time if you jump into jump into a an opportunity because it sounds exciting, and then when you get into it, you realize it wasn't everything that you hoped it would be because they don't give you any marketing support or they don't give you any leads, and for some reason you assume that they have they have not you're not able to get in touch with them at all. You know, they're not there to answer questions easily, so. Um, all of this is, is important and you know, part of that, you'll want to ask what's the chain of command, who, who do I report to, who do I ask questions to on a daily basis, how long will it take to get an answer, all things like that that are, are important. Will I get my own email address, my own maybe landing page? 
you know, it depends how are, what are all the ways in which they're going to be investing in you so that you can sell? What is the length of the sales cycle? What, what's the typical sales cycle? Everyone has different preferences, what kind of um, products they want to sell, but is it a short sales cycle? Is this something that I can have a conversation and close in the same call? Is it you know a medium sales cycle, one to three months, or is it a long sales cycle, which could take up to a year? Corporate, education, government, those, are all, those can, can be very long sales cycles. Usually the higher ticket items, are, you know, if it's over $10,000, it's going to be a longer sales cycle than something that's $1,000, okay? It's definitely different across different industries, but what sales cycle are you comfortable with? What excites you the most? For me, I like short sales cycles because I'm type A personality and I like to have wins a lot, <laughs> like every day. So I like to feel like I'm winning every day. If it's not a sale every day, it's maybe an appointment every day, but at least once a week, I like to feel like I'm winning in form of sales. <laughs> but you might feel the opposite. You might like to have that long-term sales, but you want to ask that question. The payment terms, when can you expect to be paid? Typically, you might see, you know, payment within 10 days of the client paying. Okay? That's like uh, you know, that's typical just to put it out there, but it's all should be in your agreement whatever the payment terms are and you should understand that up front. You have sales, big salesperson mistake is to wait until they make the first sale and then they not realize that they're not getting paid for a month after that. You want to know ahead of time, right? Is it right for you or, or not? You, have, you can decide that on your own, but it's a question you want to ask before you accept an opportunity. And finally, expectations. What do exactly do they expect of you? Are there any sales you know, minimum criteria that they expect you to sell? Um, are there any, you know, what are the terms for um, termination? Like, what are the expectations? If you don't sell a certain amount, do they terminate the agreement? Whatever those are, they need to be in there. Are you required to attend any sales meetings or trainings or or one-on-one -on -one calls? Sales meetings are not a bad thing, you know, if they're run well and they'll you'll get you know great benefit out of it and be part of the team. Um, but if you're expected to put that in the calendar, it's something you want to ask during the interview process, just so everything's all out on the table. And that goes both ways, right? Like you want to tell them what you expect of them, at least in the form of questions of things we've gone over so far. Um, what what do you expect from them and can, can they provide it? So it's really a two-way two -way interview, but you always want to consider all of these things when you're talking to a potential uh, company to represent. Okay. So all of those things you want to get in writing in the form of a sales, uh, independent sales contractor agreement. Um, now, there, usually that's something that the company will provide, the document that you sign. Just want to make sure that everything that you talked about is in that document. Get it reviewed by your legal team. You're in your own business now, so have your lawyer look over it. Um, most of them will be standard, but I am not a lawyer. I am not an accountant. I cannot give you legal or tax advice. <laughs> what I can do is point you in the right direction. So make sure everything's in there and that you get it looked over by a professional. And I've included links here of for tax considerations. You know, a lot of people want to know, do I have to open my own business entity? Can, you know, how do I pay taxes now that I'm not um, now that my employer is not paying taxes. So I included links here and you'll get this after the presentation too, of the, the links to the information you need in your country for the UK, US, Australia, and Canada. And if you're um, a country that's not, you know, that I didn't grab a link for, um, just Google your country, the name of the department of your, the taxation department, like in the US, it's the Department of Revenue and um, self-employed and it'll tell you what to do like I briefly looked at UK and you know, over there you have to set up you have to register as self-employed in the US you don't have to do that you just have to wait until it's time to pay taxes and then um, you file your your 1099s or you your you declare your income on what's called a schedule C um, but in all these cases you're going to be paying your own taxes because someone else is not paying them on your behalf like you may be used to. 
Um, it also means that you can write off some business expenses. So talk to your accountant about what expenses you're allowed to write off against your income. So ultimately what that does is it decreases your, your um, adjusted income so you pay less tax. At least that's how it works. For us here in the US, um, again, I'm not an accountant. You've got to go through all this with them. But, but very simply, it's, it shouldn't be something that keeps you from making the plunge to going independent. It's very simple. Um, it's just a matter of maybe keeping better records because keeping records of your expenses and keeping records of your income, um, especially if you're receiving income from overseas and they won't be reporting it you know, for you. Okay. So let's say you're ready to jump in and become independent. I hope I've convinced you. I'm definitely here to answer any questions you have individually. I want you to reach out to me because um, I've worked with so many independent reps over the years. And now, at commission, now that I'm at Commission Crowd, um, it's even easier than ever to find the right opportunity. We have over seven, now it's over 800 vetted opportunities available to you on the platform of companies that are looking for independent reps across multiple industries across the whole world. So you can find something that's right for you. Maybe you want to, you, um, maybe you're in the U S but you want to earn money in pounds because the exchange rate's really good. Um, you can do that on commission crowd. You could work, you could search and work for a company in the UK. Um, you can sell based on the time zone that you have available to work. So, all different opportunities to, to start searching in your target market that you're used to, but you can jump on there and, and we vet them to a certain extent. We turn down about half of the companies that come to us because they're not what we consider agent ready. They're not ready to bring on commission only reps. We provide for you a free CRM, so you don't have to pay for that as one of your business expenses, which can be very um, a heavy expense if, if you get one with all the bells and whistles that we offer. Um, but it's totally free for you to use and um, companies can uh, distribute leads to you via the Commission Crowd CRM. You can upload your own contacts and they'll stay hidden from your end client so you can work leads without having to share the details of your contacts. And also, once a lead is closed, you can uh, the system will automatically generate an invoice for you, um, and it will be sent off for approval and then paid through our commission payment software. So it saves you the that's an, another expense you can save um, generating invoices and you know, the bookkeeping that's involved with that um, collecting payments. Um, so we provide that commission payments and invoicing structure for you and you get paid through commission crowd right into your account. And we also have our own bonus pools and inner circles. So we're trying to give back to you as much as we can because we want you to stay on commission crowd and be part of the commission crowd family. Even though you might be selling multiple different products, we, we want commission crowd to be your home. So we are, you know, leveraging, we have over 4,000 agents at the moment and um, we are leveraging all of the sales that they make and creating large, you know, bonus pools and rewards and contests and trips and um, extra training and resources for you, annual conventions and things like that. And we offer both paid and free training and development on our site and in our school. So we're constantly trying to support you in that way. The next step is very simply to jump on commissioncrowd.com and create your profile. It looks like this. This guy has a fabulous profile because it looks like it's 100% complete. Um, it's completely free. You pay for nothing on Commission Crowd. We just want your expertise <laughs> and your sales, your sales abilities. Um, and ultimately, uh, this, this profile, once it is 65% complete, you can start applying to opportunities. But we encourage you to get it 100% complete because when company when you do apply to something and a company looks at it, it needs to show the breadth of your experience. So it's going to take it, it it'll take a, you know, I would I would invest about an hour into making sure your profile reflects you um and you know, not just, you know, 
jump into it really quickly because when um, the end clients look at you, we, we want them, we want to give them a reason to contact you to set up uh, a time to chat. So do spend the time in creating that. And once you do, you'll get an invitation to book a time with me. We can do that now as well. That's up to you. But at, if you have any questions, uh, just jump right in my calendar at jessicamagooch.youcanbook.me. That's J-E-S-S-I-C-A-M-A-G-O-C-H dot Y-O-U-C-A-N-B-O-O-K dot M-E. Um, let's book a half hour and we can get on a call Skype's preferred if you have it. You can leave that in the booking link. Otherwise, I'll give you a call on, on whatever number you provide. We can talk about what kind of opportunities might be great for you, um, depending where you are in your career. We can talk about you know how Commission Crowd can work best for you. And I can even recommend some opportunities for you to look at based on our conversation because I know lots of the companies personally on our platform. All right, well, thank you so much for joining me and I hope you join us on Commission Crowd, we are here to support you on your transition to becoming an independent sales rep. And if you're already an independent sales rep, we are here to help you grow your business and make even more money and help you achieve all the dreams and the lifestyle of, that you wish for you and your family. Have a great day. Bye.